Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of the Your Mate Tom podcast. And before I introduce this very special guest, I just want to cover a few things first. As many of you know, YouTube isn't too kind to content creators like myself. And as soon as I make any controversial topic, especially to do with drugs, all my videos get demonetized. I know, it kind of sucks. But because of a lot of you guys who support me on Patreon, I'm able to keep this channel going and we're able to grow this thing together. And you know what, it puts me in a kind of beautiful position actually not having to worry about ad revenue and things like that because first of all, I don't, have to, I don't have that pressure of having to constantly upload and I don't have to like alter the way I make content. So really I can do whatever the fuck I want, which is really cool. But again, it all depends on you guys and your support, uh, whether or not I'm able to keep this thing going. So if you guys do support this channel and want to see it continuously growing and want me to make higher quality content, then go check out Patreon. Even if you pledge as little as two bucks, it really does go a long way, especially if enough people do it. You also get a lot of cool perks like monthly live streams, giveaways, and just things, just go check it out. Another way to support this podcast is by buying merch. I got a few psychedelic designs. Uh, I'll leave a link in the show notes below. So yeah, go check it out. I'm sure you'll find something that you like. And yeah, that also supports this podcast. And I also give 10% of all profits to Maps. This podcast is also sponsored by Audible. So this is something that I've been using for a long time. I actually prefer to listen to audiobooks rather than reading. Everyone has different ways of learning, but it's really cool because you can do other shit while you're learning, essentially, like going for a nature walk, working out, driving your car. One which I would really recommend is called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, which me and Koi actually cover during this podcast. So yeah, go check it out. It will absolutely change your life. And also Mastery by Robert Greene. Those two books are just incredible and you can just read them over and over and over and over again and still extract so much wisdom from it. Oh, and just for those who don't know, I recently launched my second channel, Raw Spirituality, which is a channel that it basically covers a practical approach to personal and spiritual growth. And even though this channel is a self-help channel of sorts, I definitely tackle it in a unique way. And, you know, I definitely plan on doing some more parody satire stuff. And, well, man, I can really do whatever the fuck I want with this channel, which is really beautiful. Um, you know, I just started. But, yeah, I definitely think that this is something that you guys want to check out. And I believe that it can give you a lot of value. So, yeah, go check it that out. Now, this brings me to my next guest, another fellow YouTuber, Koi Fresco, who makes content about personal and spiritual growth. Um, and him, him and me are on the same page on a lot of things. And he was, he's just a really all-around cool guy to talk to. And he's so open-minded and positive. And that's why I admire his work, especially because I know how much he's positively impacting a lot of people. This was a very insightful, authentic conversation, which I'm so grateful to have that experience and for him to even jump on this podcast. But we covered a lot of ground. We covered science, what is God, enlightenment, lucid dreaming, astral projection, psychedelics, his path, how he got started. And he talked a little bit about how he spent a year in jail and just what that did for his life, starting his YouTube channel. What the fuck? I'm just going to wait till that ends. Okay, cool. Like we also talked about his daily spiritual practices and what keeps him in the peak state. Um, and I also got a few of my favorite questions from Instagram, which I asked you guys a while back. And if you want to get involved with future podcast guests and want to ask certain questions, then go follow me on Instagram at yourmatetom3. That's pretty much it, guys. I'm still in Thailand at the moment, and I'm going to go to Cambodia and Vietnam for the next month or so. So I will not be having access to good internet. So... I'm pretty sure this is going to be a break for a while. I don't even know when this video is going to be uploaded, maybe a few weeks from now. But as soon as I get back home to Australia, that's when I'm going to like really focus on creating content for this channel. And like I said, depends on you guys. And the more you support me on Patreon, the better content I'm able to make, especially things that I've been holding off, like certain documentaries, like my girlfriend's acid experience and her ayahuasca documentary. And I've got some cool other things like trip simulations and other things that I don't want to talk about here, but um, yeah, it just requires a lot of time and effort. So go check out Patreon if you want to see these kind of content come to fruition, right? But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it. I'm sure you're going to love this podcast as much as I did. And there's a lot of gold nuggets in this conversation. Um, a lot of controversial stuff we covered as well, which I'm sure is going to trigger some of you. 
But if you do get emotionally triggered, you should always look back on yourself and why is this stuff coming up for you. But anyways, that's it. Enjoy the podcast. Catch you guys on the next video. Peace. Welcome everybody to a special episode of Your Mate Tom where we got a fellow YouTuber, Koi Fresco, who focuses on making content on personal and spiritual growth. So how's it going, man? Greetings, brother. How are you? <laughs> very, very good. <laughs> We're on literally complete opposite time zones right now. It's like nine o'clock in sunny California, and it's like eleven o'clock in nighttime here in Thailand. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we uh we figured out a, a good time that we could both get on this <laughs> yeah, this all, chat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm on holiday anyway, so it's all good. Um, so I guess I just wanted to start off this podcast by I know it's very cliche, but I always like asking guests on just how they got started on this path. So how did you get started on this spiritual path or whatever you want to call it? Like on yeah. your channel, you talk about spending a year in jail. I don't know if that was a catalyst mm -hmm. for it. Do you just want to talk about that? Yeah, it was definitely, that was definitely a catalyst. Uh, one of many. I, I wrote a book on it actually. Not not trying to plug, but my, my first book Plugged that I wrote away, last man. summer was, <laughs> was kind of uh, about, you know, my path and how I found this because I think it's, that's what's so interesting about life is we all, come to our path in so many different ways. Mm. Um, they're rarely the same way. So for me, you know, I was just kind of the typical kid growing up, uh, partying a lot, very into my ego, very into drug use, just experimenting, which is fine. But I kind of was lost in it for quite a while. I didn't know who I was, didn't know what I was doing. Started getting into trouble. Uh, long story short, I got a DUI when I was 18. My friends were in the car, they got hurt. Not too bad, they're all fine, but I had to spend a year in jail because of that at 19 years old. So when all of your friends are going off to college, you know, and everyone's getting new jobs and you're sitting in a cell, you, it's, it's very humbling. You can't really be in that ego space yeah. when you're at the lowest of the low on a societal level. So it gave me a lot of time to look inside. You know, a, a year's a long time to be in the same room for you know days on end so it would be a lot of time to self-inquire i would imagine yes yeah. yes lots of self-inquiry i mean you you can you can ignore it you know some people do ignore it and they they you know they, they play it off but a lot of people spend a lot of time in there you know looking into themselves and i think that's why you also see with with prison a lot of people that are in there for a long time become different people mm. uh, just by nature of being in that kind of monastic style of living by force but I just started looking into different religions, researching different stuff because there's a library, you can rent books. And one of the things I came upon was Taoism, which is, you know, the way, you know, understanding the way and living with the way and seeing everything as the way incarnate. Uh, so that was what sparked my, my curiosity. And when I got out of jail, I, you know, it, it really kind of kickstarted me. I realized I just kind of lost, in a sense, on an on a interactive level, a year of my life. Mm. So I was like, I wanted to make up for it. So I spent a lot of my time researching and diving more and more into all these different practices and all these different philosophies. I, I fell in love with Buddhist philosophy um, and just continued practicing that for years until I, I moved out west. And that's when I started the channel. And you know, ever since then, you know, blessed to have the channel actually take off, which I, I never expected when, when I began it, but I've just been, you know, continuing to work on myself and work with others since that time. Nice, man. So, what, so you, you didn't have any experience making YouTube videos or any marketing? It just blew up just never. like that? Nice. Never. <laughs> really? It's, it's interesting. The, actually, the only reason I even made a channel and began, you know, teaching online was because I went and got coffee with a friend and she... She had, she made YouTube videos, okay. but we were different people. She was more so into um, just blogging and different stuff like mm. that. I was just out here working a job at a restaurant, and I used to always tweet about this kind of stuff and talk about you know just different little spiritual topics and link different things. And so she would always notice that. So when we got coffee, she actually one time she sat down and she's like, "You should make videos on what you tweet about." Mm. And that was the first time you know the seed was planted. So. Interesting. At first, I kind of shrugged it off, and I was like, "No, nah, no one would watch that." Uh, I guess my ego didn't want to take, you know, take a little, you know, a risk. But um, yeah, eventually, a couple months later, I, I kind of <laughs> finally talked myself into doing it, and I'm glad I did. Yeah, man. You, yeah, it seemed like your channel blew up quite quick, and you've got quite a large following. So it's mm -hmm. good that you 
yeah, you bit the bullet and did it. Yeah, definitely. I, I, one of the a good thing my friend taught me too as well was um, when he was in college, he was taking marketing classes and they were saying, you know, if you take the first step, you're ahead of 99% of any, everybody else because yeah, most people exactly. just, they just hold the idea in mind, but they don't actually start physically manifesting that. Yeah, so it's all execution, right? You, yeah, yeah. just by you taking that first step at all, you're already ahead of the curve. And what was your intention before starting this channel? Like, was it specifically to help people or just talk about cool co cool topics that you're interested in? Or was it to maybe work on yourself? Maybe all the yeah, above? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was kind of a mixture of all the above. Yeah. For me, it was the reason I would always tweet about that kind of stuff was because how I've always, you know, thought is if I learn something interesting, I want to share it. Mm. That's just my first thought. You know, if I something really gets into my mind, I want other people to know as well. And so that's kind of what I try to use the channel as is, is explaining what I think is important to what I'm learning and to what I think is pertinent to what people need to know right now. Mm. Um, which is cool because that's what I like about having a channel is it's not just me presenting random information. It's the evolution of myself. You, you can mm. see if you go through months and years of my channel, it changes slightly and topics change and I get more into certain topics than others because that's how I'm growing in my personal life. Yeah. So it, it's definitely a reflection of, of my practice as well. Yeah, I can totally relate. Um, have you mm. found yourself changing certain opinions or views on life mm -hmm. over the years and do you like maybe regret or cringe when you watch your past videos like, oh, I shouldn't have said it like that or anything like that? I actually, uh, <laughs> I, I like it every once in a while going back and looking at my first videos because it helps me get out of, you know, of my judgmental self. Yeah. The first couple of videos, it, it's, I think for everybody who creates videos, you're like, oh gosh, <laughs> yeah. what was I doing there? But, but I like looking at it because I can see how, how much of a different person I am, you know, how much progress have been made since then. Uh, a lot of my videos used to be a mixture of kind of spiritual and esoteric stuff with scientific stuff, mm -hmm. just random theories and, and ideas. And I used to, I covered a lot of philosophies, but the more I got into my practice, the more I kind of, I had one of the epiphanies I have was that science is great and scientific, anything is amazing. Science is a very important part of life. But but for spiritual growth, a lot of what science does is, is get us more into a question mind state and, and more into a, a, a outside of the self mind state, mm. which is the opposite of spiritual practice where you want to self inquire and just be with the moment and, and find peace in, in what's going on here and now. So it's kind of a dichotomy. You know, I want to learn all this stuff, but the more I learn, the more questions I have, the more questions I have, the more agitated I might become, mm. the less the less I might be able to live in the moment, the less mindful I might be able to be. So I've shifted over the past year, especially away from more scientific topics and more so into personal growth, because I think that's where uh, people need the most help. You know, mm. science, science will always be there. We will we anybody. There are tons and tons of science channels. Yeah, but there are, I think, a lot less um, channels based on self inquiry and growing mm. personally. I think that's what's important. Yeah, it's funny you say that, actually, because I can uh, I was a bit the same when I first started. I was originally going to go more to like maybe just purely focus on the science behind psychedelics and stuff like that mm -hmm. but i was more interested in more the subjective mind mapping of yes, the psychedelic definitely. experience more the philosophical mm -hmm. aspect and there wasn't a lot of people doing that but then yeah i actually saw a channel called the drug classroom i don't know if you heard about it but that's mm -hmm. like a really good channel about just the scientific aspects of psychedelics and when i saw his yeah. channel i'm like oh awesome i don't have to do that anymore because someone yes, does such exactly. a good job on it so why should I do it when it, there's so many people who do the same thing as well? Mm -hmm. So, But yeah, I understand that it's more about the balance of like self-inquiry and science because sometimes if you're too imbalanced, you might just be stuck in your mind. And like me, I'm very naturally in my head, so sometimes it doesn't do me any favors. And it's good just to mm -hmm. yeah be here and now, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I think what I also don't want people to get wrong is that it's, I think people think if you, if you say, you know, you don't need to focus on science that you're anti-science, which is, yeah, is not the case. No. It's more so, I think it's important to, to come to into a personal foundation before you start using science, you know? Yeah. So you can actually do so in a way that doesn't erode the foundation of what you think you are. Yeah. And, th and that's why I think when a lot of people aren't mentally stable or aren't in a space of loving awareness or, or understanding their practice or their path, when they start looking into different scientific things, you know, such as black holes and, and the nature of the universe and how old it is, it can be very existential. It can be, it can be scary. You know, yeah, it can be almost, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
it, it can be a, a daunting thing, especially with psychedelics involved. It, it can put you in a, a state of mind where you really don't even want to be here anymore. So I always yeah. think, you know, it's important to have that mental health first before we go into mm. getting really deep into, into racking our brains about what's going on beyond the self. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that as well, because I, I had a psychedelic triggered existential crisis, which was very harrowing and the more I learnt about this existential stuff or even when just the thought of black holes and the infinite universe just made yeah. it so much worse. I'm like, man, I've got to step away from that a little bit and just mm-hmm. focus on being in my body, being here. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I, yeah, I can totally understand. I think I actually, way. I think I saw that video. That was on uh, Adam's channel, correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm still like, why? But anyways, <laughs> yes. We did. I did a boga, which was uh, which is one of the most potent psychedelics, which requires extra strong guardrails. You know, I didn't do yes. it, and I always preach this. That's the the thing. Like you should always either do it with a shaman or a facilitator, yeah. or at least someone who knows what they're doing. And Adam, of course, is very knowledgeable on psychedelics, but he has no experience on facilitating a boga ceremonies or anything like that. So, would you would you say that you regret doing it? Yeah, that's my yeah. one regret. Like, I don't regret, I've, like, done some pretty fucked up shit and gone through Mm -hmm. some pretty dark times, but this one was, like, it sent me back a lot. I'm recovering now, it's part of the reason why I'm in Thailand, just to have space and time to myself, kind of self-inquire, being focused on the Buddhism culture, doing a lot of meditation, exercise and all that kind of stuff, and getting coaching and therapy as well, which I think is very Mm -hmm. important, because a lot of people just kind of suffer in silence. Yes, yes, I think that's very important to reach out for help. So. Yeah, but doesn't they call it uh, the sangha, your spiritual community? Your community is what really kind of helps you, you yeah. know, keep, stay stay on your feet when you when you feel like falling. Exactly, and people, you know, exactly, you get the encouragement to like, no, you keep going. This this will be, you know, this will pass. And I'm very, I feel well, very blessed to have a following and so much support and the opportunity that I can go to Thailand and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm very grateful for that, and I've definitely learned a lot from this experience for sure. And I know that some people will say like, oh, there's no such thing as bad trips as long as you learn. And I'm like, I used to say that all the time, but at the same time, it wasn't necessary for me to go there. I could have, you know what I mean? Like I didn't need to learn that. But it happened. So there's no point dwelling on it. I'm definitely well, just, what aspect, if you don't mind me asking, what aspect of, of the trip kind of set you back? It was more the overwhelm, because I came back a bit fragmented. So it, was a, it wasn't necessarily like a bad trip that made me regret it because I've had some terrifying trips before, but at least when it's over, it's like, oh, okay, I'm back. It's all good. But this Mm -hmm. one was a perspective shift and it was like the acute awareness of all the suffering, the pain in the world. And I was in this constant process of grief and things like that. So Mm -hmm. every time I would be with family or friend, it's like, I just want to ball out crying because I'd be so aware that they're going to die and the, and so many yes, people yes. suffering and like yes yeah, so i was just my consciousness was just kind of stuck in that void in the abyss i don't know what you want to call it but yeah i didn't quite come back for a while until yeah i just got coaching and help and you know learned a lot of techniques to come back from it but yeah it was more that <laughs> yeah i mean i could definitely see how it would be you know frightening not to fully come back after a trip and realizing there's still you know a part of you yeah. a part of what you see yourself as missing yeah exactly um, well, I guess this is a good segue to the next topic because people will um, be very upset with me if I don't ask you about psychedelics. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what, are, what is your experience with psychedelics and have they helped you at all in your spiritual path? Oh, not really? Was it just some fun thing that you did as a kid? Or I, I think, uh, I, well, <clears throat> I've been sober now about, yeah. about five years, so, mm-hmm. so quite a while. Uh, but... In my late teens, and you know, I, I did LSD for the first time when I was 16, mm-hmm. so that was an eye-opening oh, that's experience. Quite, that's quite young, yeah. Yes, yes, I remember. <laughs> it was a uh, not a common thing at, at that age for people around us, but um, I think when I first began doing it, it was it was less for personal growth, more for like the the outlandish effects that come from it. You know, it's when being my you wanted to trip out. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. We went on a trip. I mean, my friends and I were researching. We're like, we can pay this amount of money and we get 12 hours of effects. That's like a great deal. Bang for uh, your buck, huh? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So so I did it quite a few times. LSD was always my go-to. You know, yeah. I, I say, you know, even being sober for five years, 
the only compound that I miss over this five year period, not even miss, but that I would, I kind of think every once in a while, like, Oh, I'd like to do that is LSD. Mm. LSD was always, you know, the go-to compound for me. Um, I, I did experiment with, with mushrooms a few times. Uh, but, but I just, it just, I didn't enjoy it the way okay. I enjoyed LSD. What was the I, dose? I, what was the dose that you had for mushrooms? I, I'm not sure. Around around uh, an eighth, probably. May, maybe a little bit more. Maybe a little bit less. Okay. Um, but I just remember. I think I enjoyed LSD more because it was a lot more mental. You know, mushrooms mm. are a lot more physical. LSD is a lot more of your thought process and in your mind. So yeah. I think that's maybe why I enjoyed it more. But looking back, you know, it definitely helped me, I think, on, on, a, on an unconscious level because, like you said, we were doing it to trip out. So I wasn't really doing it to have, you know, insightful experiences. I hadn't yeah. discovered Eastern philosophy or Ayurveda or Hinduism or Buddhism or any of that. It was just, you know, tripping. So <laughs> Seeing it, it pretty did, fractals, it did. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. You know, kaleidoscopes in your eyes and everything. <laughs> but it did help me, I think, on a, on a subconscious level years later kind of looking back on on where my thoughts began to change and where maybe i opened up a little bit it started with psychedelics that's for sure but i was still just so so stuck in my ego that i, I wasn't allowing it to fully yeah you know to fully have have me you know to to embrace me i was trying to control the lsd instead of letting the lsd kind of do its thing mm. uh so it was great. It was, it was an amazing process. You know, I tell people this too. I think a lot of time people think when, when you're sober, when you don't do psychedelics or drugs, that you're automatically anti, you know, compounds. And it's, well, no, not at all. I think they can yeah, definitely yeah. be a tool. You yeah. know, I think for anybody, it can be a tool, but it depends on where you are mentally, why you're taking it, um, what you expect, especially that you're going to get out of it. And um, if it's the right time or not. And one of the things I would always you know, talk to people about and they'd ask me about it, psychedelics, I'd be like, they'd uh, say, you know, I've, I've been thinking about taking it. And I would always say, you know, well, wait, wait till you, you want to take it. You know, you want to exactly. be in a space mentally where mm. you definitely want to do it. If you're, if you're going into it with maybes and kind ofs and uh, I don't know, then those insecurities are going to are going to present themselves during your trip. And you don't you don't want to I don't, I don't think a lot of people want to have a bad trip their first time around. I think it turns a lot of people off when they do. No. Yeah, exactly. Especially when you don't process and learn from it then it can be problematic yeah. Um, but yeah I agree you should definitely have a very strong desire and a call for it and not just mm. out of curiosity and maybe if, if you do do it out of that reason like you could have a good time or you could be beneficial but I don't think it's worth the risk like if you're not yes, really exactly. certain because yeah I think probably one of the subconscious reasons I don't like uh, <clears throat> mushrooms as much is because I had an ego death on mushrooms oh really but Yes, uh, I, I did a video on it, but my only ego death that I've really ever had from psychedelics was on mushrooms, and it was it was intense, and it was it was a lot, you know. It, it's kind of like your situation. It took me a few weeks to really get back to where I remembered being before I took it. Mm. Um, yeah, so mushrooms can that, be a lot more kind of, merciless than LSD, yes, yes. usually, anyway. Yes. But, you know, was, obviously, uh, obviously, some people love mushrooms a lot more than LSD and vice versa, but in the end of the day, they're just magnifiers of who we are. In exactly, a sense. exactly. But different lenses, I suppose. Mm -hmm. that I, yeah, definitely, so, I definitely believe that every substance is slightly different and can get you to different places. Yeah. yeah. And I definitely, you know, going forward in the future down the road, I don't, I don't, I tell people, you know, I'm not saying that I'll never do psychedelics again. It's just that my path right now, what I'm practicing now, is, is in a space of sobriety and, and clear, yeah. a completely clear conscious mind. Yeah. Um, so I that get. When I do practice with them again, if I decide to, they will actually be. I can use them as the tools they were intended to be used mm. as. You have a much stronger foundation to be able exactly. to get a much better experience for sure. Yeah, and uh, the yeah. foundation is, is everything. You know. Yeah. So, w would you not recommend for sixteen-year-olds to have to drop acid? <laughs> yeah, I, I would not recommend it. I think I think I should have waited. You're being you know, a hypocrite think... now. No, I'm joking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, because I did it at even twenty-one. Even then, I would if I could go back in time, I would have waited until I was older. Yeah, definitely. Maybe it's not I, even just age because you can still be super, you can still have a very weak foundation of a mind and be old. So yeah. it's not just age. I think it's, it's just like any, any drug at that age, you know, you're still coming into forming an idea of who you are or what, what it means yeah. to be who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're taking psychedelics at, at that age, it can really, it can misdirect you. I think that's the problem is that it can misdirect you into thinking, oh, no, never mind. This is who I am. You know, I, either way, you're picking an identity, which can be a problem in the future. 
Exactly. So if, if you think, you know, I think it's healthier to have an identity that you kind of naturally come upon as you're, you know, 16 years of growth and aging and then work through that as you get older versus to pick the, the psychedelic identity that you, you bestow upon yourself from one or two trips. Mm. I think that can be a problem because it, it's something that comes out of a trip. It's not there with you all the time. Yeah, it's not as sustainable, um, yeah. especially if you don't integrate because that integration is like 90% of it, right? Like yes, exactly. Much, if, not, if not more. Mm. Um, otherwise, I like to just say it's just, you're just spiritually masturbating if you're just tripping yeah. and not actually integrating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, cool, man. I guess I want to go into who, like, which philosophies do you most subscribe to? Like, who are your biggest inspirations? Whether it's people mm -hmm. or religions or maybe everything, you you just you treat it like a buffet, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think it's a mixture of a couple of different philosophies. I, I began with Buddhist philosophy, you know, um, mm. just the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha himself, because it's so simple. You know, it's just a core tenet saying, look, you suffer because you're attached mm -hmm. in whatever form you might be attached. You can transcend that attachment and here are some steps to transcend it. That's all it really is, you know. Um, is saying that that's our nature, you know, as, as long as we live in these conditioned bodies and we have a perception on life, we're going to suffer because we think of that as a, a finite thing or as a solid thing, when in reality, it's just our, our mind illusory, in an illusory state identifying with it as, mm. as such. Nothing's, you know, nothing's solid, nothing's forever. Um, it's all temporal, so that's important yeah. to understand. Impermanence. So in, mm. Yes, imper impermanence is, is the foundation of Buddhism. Mm. So for me, th those philosophies are really, really poignant and powerful. Uh, and I've used them you know, for, for years now to kind of grow and, and thrive. And that's why I've talked many times on my channel about Buddhism. I've done you know, lectures on Buddhism. I think I have like six videos on it. Mm. Because I think it is, I think it is uh, one of the, the best starting places for spiritual practice. I tell people, yeah. Buddha, I think Buddhism is, if I had to recommend something to begin with, I would probably say Buddhist philosophy. Yeah, I've been immersing it, myself in Buddhism since I'm here in Thailand, I might as well take advantage. I should do like, yes, two, exactly. two, like a silent meditation retreat. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I agree because Buddhism isn't as like metaphysical or esoteric. It just focuses on yes. here right now, you know what I mean? And like I'm reading a book right now, it's called like, what the Buddhism actually taught and yeah. he I didn't know but because a lot of Buddhism believe in like reincarnation and souls mm -hmm. and this and that but Buddha, Buddha didn't really concern himself with that because it's all yeah. speculation he, not necessarily, exactly. he's not saying that it's real or not real but again he just didn't concern himself with that so it was a very kind what? of practical approach to personal growth so I, 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 really, a, I really admire Buddhism there's a term in Buddhism um, I forget what, what the word is for it but it basically means noble speech. And what it talks about is, it's kind of like that with the Buddha. People would come to the Buddha with questions, you know, well, why am I alive? What is my purpose? Yeah. <laughs> what is this going? What is life? When did this all begin? And he would just say, you're, you're too far. You're too far away. You know, come back to the moment. Just be right here. All those questions, you can ask those till, till the sun goes down, but you're not going to get the answers you want. And even if you get an answer, it's just going to breed more questions. So come back to the moment. Just, just come sit down, be quiet breathe, enjoy the beautiful, you know, scenery around you, yeah. you know, you're, you're too far off. And that was kind of like we said earlier, that was my thing with realizing, you know, science is great, but it just takes us away from a space of, of loving awareness, mm. um, which can be a problem if, if we don't have that. It can make us into major cynics and we can become very, you know, um, it, it's regressive in a sense. I've noticed a lot and you'll see this a lot, you know, with people is that the more scientifically based we become inclined, the more the less human we become, we become kind of like logic machines. And all we care about is what can be logically proven or what cannot, you know, if that's a, a fallacy or if it's not a fallacy, yeah. um, which, which isn't our nature. That's not our nature. Our nature is, is communal. Our nature is interactive. It's loving. It's, it's being with other human beings. Yeah. Well, it's like we're so desperate as humanity to like know the truth. But in the end of the day, there is no truth with a capital T that you can quantify and put in a bag. <laughs> Like, you know, like, like you're measuring mathematics, like it's just never Yes, exactly. Happen. So yeah. just enjoy so, so. life, be happy. Yeah, that's, anyway, that's my philosophy. That's to have sustainable peace and happiness. Like exactly. I've been such a seeker of like truth. What, what is the nature of reality? What happens after death? And got so involved into that. And if you want to get involved with that, go ahead. But it's just not, it's just the balance of it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'll talk about it for fun, but I don't attach myself to any ideas anymore. Well, actually in that, 
the last Oberga trip that actually helped me yeah, not yeah. to kind of step away from it. Like, oh, okay, I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm never going to know at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's, uh, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, it's all good. There's, um, that leads kind of me into, you know, what I've, where my practice has grown over the past year or so. Mm. Um, from Buddhism into something that is, it, it's a Hindu philosophy, actually. I've been getting far more into Hinduism. Oh, right. Uh, because I've, I've gone into yet, that, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful, but you know, yeah. Buddhism stems out of Hinduism, mm. so yeah. it is it is a branch essentially of Hindu philosophy that the, that the Buddha just kind of simplified. But yeah. it was all already there in the Vedas and in the Hindu teachings. And there's a philosophy in Hinduism that deals with the nature of reality in a way that is it really is fulfilling, and it makes the most sense to me out of everything I've researched. Mm. Um, it's I go as far to say as if, if somebody can sit down and like read about this philosophy and actually kind of implement it with science, it, it just makes the most sense out of anything. And it's called Advaita Vedanta. And what Advaita Vedanta pretty much means is the Vedanta Vedanta is teachings of the Vedas. Advaita means non-dual. So okay. oneness. Yeah. All encapsulating. So non-dual teachings of the Vedas. And it and it uses the Vedas and these ancient scriptures from thousands and thousands of years ago, I think five to 7,000 years ago, to discern the nature of, of reality and what thisness is. But it does so in a way that involves empiricism, which is, you know, physical proof. And that's, that's a big part of Advaita is, look, you can have faith, but blind faith isn't real faith because there's still doubt. Mm. You, you can say you have faith, but you don't because you're doubting. And uh, a comedian George Carlin once talked about this and he went, you know, if Christians really believed in, in a God and a heaven, they wouldn't cry when people died. They wouldn't be sad at funerals because mm. they know they would see them again. Yeah. They'd be with them very soon. But, That's but a good point. They, they might not even know, but they have a complete set of doubts in their mind that this is the complete end and that I will never be with that person again, regardless of how much faith they have portrayed. Yeah. Um, and that, that can be a problem. To have that in the back of your mind isn't healthy, no. even if we're not aware of it. So Advaita uses empiricism and living in this moment and being with life and, and scientifically kind of shows the nature of reality is more than likely non-dual which means one yeah so say me and you we we have the idea of me and you being here together and being separate on a skype call thousands of miles away but that's only because we're using words to identify me as this body and you as that body mm. over there and therefore we're separate when in reality, everything is in relation. So I am here right now breathing the same air that you are breathing. You know, it's all part of one atmospheric system. So if, if I say, I can't scientifically say that I end where my body ends because I exist in relation to the air I breathe. And if you exist in relation to the air you breathe, that means we are both part of one organism, yeah. which involves that, you know, the atmosphere. So there isn't really... And that's just one little example. There isn't, there's no separation. We just use the separation of where our control ends to decide this is me versus this is not me. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's one of the philosophies of Advaita is it goes deeper and deeper into showing, kind of walking you step by step, showing you kind of how, look, all these ideas of what you think separateness is, is false. There, in fact, it goes as far to say, you know, while most things have an opposite, there's no such thing. There can't be a non-existence because we exist right now. Since yeah. there is an existence, yeah. there, there scientifically cannot be any form of non-existence ever mm. because there is existence. You know, it's... Um, it's deep shit, which is, it is. It's hard <laughs> to wrap your mind around. But no, it's, I get you. It's, it's, one of, it's one of the, the core understandings, the teachings that I got from these really... Intense yeah. psychedelic experiences. It was like, oh, mm -hmm. this is, we're all part of the same thing. We're like, there's no such yeah. thing as separateness. It's an illusion. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's kind of, it has the same, it uses the same steps as uh, psychedelics in a sense. You know, yeah. it's, it's a lot more complicated, but it has the same idea of getting us outside of our human shell. Yeah. You know, the whole problem with, with seeing oneness and getting that we're interconnected and that we are all of it, the whole of the universe kind of incarnate in this conscious form is that we are looking through like a human perspective. So I have a human lens on in the universe. Well, it's how am I going to understand that I'm the universe when I'm stuck looking through a pinhole of humanity? It's, it's, yeah. it's impossible. And there's this philosopher named Shankara or Adi Shankaracharya, who one of his ways of explaining this was that, you know, a fire doesn't know that it's hot. A, a fire is just a fire. It's just, it's just fire firing. How is it going to know it's hot if it doesn't have a reference to that? Mm. It can't. 
It's all um, relative, so right? Way, yeah. Yeah, it's all relative. So in the same way, how are we? How is a human supposed to know that it is all of reality when it's still humaning? Mm. If a human is just a human, we don't have a reference point to what totality is, and mm. it's just one of those philosophies that kind of helps you understand that um, in a way that really is foundational. So for me, it's been absolutely amazing. With like you said, those kind of thoughts just it, it helps you answer them in a way to you're like, yeah, I probably never have to ask this question again because I I'm starting to actually get it. It makes that much mm. sense. Um, so it's really powerful. It's it's a beautiful philosophy. Yeah, it's one that I wanted to get into after this, because um, yeah, Buddhism is like so huge here. So I'm like, yeah, I might yes. as well focus on and my there, thing. There's so many time. schools of Buddhism as well. Same thing with yeah. Buddhism. There's so many schools. Exactly, exactly. Some I guess that I would agree with more than others and stuff, but yeah, um, yeah. I guess I would just, in the end of the day, I just go to the core teachings of the Buddha. I I like yeah. his philosophy. Um, mm-hmm. Any other any Certain, any teachers or anything like that that influenced uh, you? Or most people? of them are dead. Most, <laughs> most of them are dead. Yeah. Like who? I feel like that's, like that's the case Watts? with a lot of people. But um, a few would be there's a teacher named Sri Ramakrishna. Yeah. He has he's a book called The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. It's a beautiful book. Um, as I just said, Adi Shankaracharya. He's a, he's a great philosopher, an Indian philosopher. I think that's another thing is. Most of us only hear about the philosophies of Western, you know, the Western philosophy and, yeah. and uh, Greece and Rome and, you know, the American philosophy in the early 1900s, uh, in the early 20th century. But but there were, are hundreds of Vedic and Indian philosophers that we just don't know about because India is a very, you know, not secluded, but it's a very communal place. So they don't yeah. really, they're not trying to spread those philosophies outward. It's only if we look into yeah. the history of India that we start to see these philosophers who have already been kind of portraying what the West is saying now for thousands of years. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, obviously I, I love Alan Watts and Terence McKenna as a prophet, but, um, Ram Dass, Ram Dass is, is one of my, you know, one of my teachers right now currently, he's still alive. He, he's 86 and he, he's a beautiful teacher of you yeah, know, this kind of, he's amazing. this yeah. basic philosophy of really just love everyone, you know, love everyone is, is the whole tenet of his practices. That's, that's what will change the world is, is finding a way to open up and love everyone. Yeah. It's so cliche, but it's so true. I can't yes, get and that's the thing, you know, you know, soul practice is supposed to be that simple. Yeah. We just yeah. We want to complicate it because we, as humans, we like to know things. We like to gain information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if, somebody says just, if someone says just love everyone, you're like, well, what, what else can I get? You know, I want more. Yeah. That's not, that's, that's not fulfilling enough for our, for our minds in a lot of ways, yeah. which is also a great practice to tell us, look, you don't have to, you know, Seeking doesn't mean seeking for years. You can seek for a minute and get that sentence, and that's all you need. Yeah, just, just letting go of expectations, having non-attachment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty and much. Paradoxically, that's when you'll attract what you what you want. Yeah, <laughs> yes, every time. <laughs> yeah, um, you just mentioned Alan Watts. Do you subscribe to his philosophy of when he's talking about psychedelics of once you get the message, hang up the phone? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I've said that, I've said that many times, and. That kind of, for me, is another reason you know, I stopped, is I think I, I got the message at the time that I needed to take a break, that I needed to come to a place personally where I could utilize psychedelics in the way that I, I needed to utilize them. I kind of, after that ego death, especially with the mushrooms, I realized, you know, I was, I was really just abusing psychedelics. I was taking mm. them for granted. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think on the opposite end, when you, when you do get a, you know, a more, I think, liberating and uplifting message from psychedelics and you use them correctly, it's important to come back to a sober state because you know, I talk about this a lot of my videos and I think a lot of people who do psychedelics might disagree, but we don't live in a natural state of LSD infused reality. You know, it'd be we're too not much. Here. Yeah, it'd be too overwhelming. It'd be too much. Yeah. <laughs> and so the thing is you, you can utilize these tools as much as you want, but at, Ram Dass spoke about this actually, and you know, he would take LSD and you know, psychedelics for yeah. days on end. He knew a thing or two about psychedelics. <laughs> yes, yes. But every time you'd be yeah. come back and you'd be like, oh, I want to be there. You know, I want to yeah. be where the psychedelics put me. Mm. And the thing is, is that we, we can come to that place naturally, but we have to do it naturally. Yeah. You can't, you can't take psychedelics, be in that state, come back and be there as well. You're going to come back. It's, it's a difference. So, um, hold on one second. Somebody just knocked oh, on my door. Oh, good, man. But, um, yeah, as I was saying, the, the important thing is that once we have these experiences, these kind of glimpses, which the psychedelic lens gives us is a glimpse. Mm-hmm. We, we need to come back and work on that naturally because we can be in that state of awareness and that space of mental kind of 
getting it of unity on a natural state, we just have to take the time to cultivate it. Mm. And that's, that's why I love that metaphor that Alan Watts used. You know, there's X amount of doors. Psychedelics might get you through a majority of those doors, but you still have to open the last 20 doors on your own. Yep. And yep. It's, it's worth it. You know, it's kind of, I think that's the big problem with the only problem I'd say with psychedelics is that people don't get that they are also just like anything we use TV, you know, porn. It's, 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 instant gratification mm. on the most spiritual levels well it's easy to just trip out like you don't need to exactly. have any very, very particular very... skill or intelligence it's like all you have to do is just pluck a mushroom yes. and then there you go you're there yes yeah. you know any but that's the thing anybody can take a tap yeah anybody can take a tap yeah <laughs> it takes a lot though to come back after that and, and start implementing these practices that also yeah. help you you know rise to that that vibrational level of, of awareness that you have on these compounds yeah, and that, yeah. That, that can take months, that can take years, but it's, it's, that's what the spiritual path is. Well, and sometimes the, the most challenge, I was talking about it to a friend the other day, and sometimes the most challenging thing to do could be like, I don't know, maybe reconciling with your father or something, but then yes. someone will be like, oh, no, nah, but I, I need a trip so I can get another insight. And man, I know what I'm talking about because my whole identity was built around these psychedelics and this last trip mm. kind of, oh, I finally understand um, Alan Watts' philosophy because yes, I th- and I heard about it. I'm like, oh yeah, I can understand. But at the same time, some people would say, oh, but psychedelics is a ongoing dialogue. There's always so much more to learn and mm-hmm. about yourself and the nature of reality. But then at the same time, it's a never-ending rabbit hole, and you just you you might get. There's always rules to the exception, I suppose. But yeah, yeah, um, it takes a very special person to actually. To really benefit from them and continuously take them, yeah. Such as Terence McKenna. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. He's, he's, one like of the, he's one of the examples. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like he, he's it, the it can be done. Like don't get me wrong, it can definitely be done, but it's very, very rare, and everyone thinks that they can get away with it. Like me, I was like, yeah, okay. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool, man. Very interesting response, but yeah, it took me a very brutal experience to finally come to realize that. Um, and I think, you know, I've noticed too, is a, I, the psych, psychedelics are, are also one of those communities where people get defensive if you say, you know, anything. Yes, that actually reminds me, some people, because I started talking about it, and I'm not against it, I'm actually, for the first time, I'm not attached to it, like, whether it's yes. good or bad, I'll just say it how it is. Um, but yeah, I've got a lot of people, I don't know about a lot, but a few people are like, oh, I'm, I'm subscribing and stuff like that, and it's like they get, it's like their identification gets threatened yes I'm, exactly it's like i'm kind of ruin, ruining their party or something <laughs> yeah it's, it's like you you identify as someone who takes like a dog so as soon yeah. as somebody says maybe you shouldn't it's, it's kind of it, it becomes a personal attack in that moment exactly exactly and as soon as you yeah. emotionally react with anything it's nothing to do with what the other person is saying mm-hmm. anyway yeah sure. precisely you know i've noticed that with uh i did it, one of my biggest videos was why i stopped smoking wheat and i talked about yes. basically i was just i was just lazy when i would smoke um, and I had a brigade of stoners, you know, coming into my comments saying, you know, it's not the weed, it's you. And I'm like, yes, I know. That's what I was saying in the yeah. video. It's not the weed, it's me. That's why I stopped. I uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not attacking your compound whatsoever. Marijuana is an amazing compound. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, I think we're very used to, especially in the West now, playing the victim role, right? Anytime somebody disagrees with our position, we think it's an attack. Yeah. And that's that's usually not the case. Yeah, exactly. And you, I can tell by your videos that you always come from a place of, yeah, this is my journey, this is what works for me. And this mm-hmm. is exactly the same approach that I take with my videos. And I make it very clear that I'm just speaking from my experience. Yes. And I made the and same I try video. To yeah, I made the same video as well. Neutrality like I, as a basis. Yeah. And I made the same uh, similar video that like why I quit smoking weed, at least for a while. And it was like, didn't get a whole bunch of dislikes, but definitely more dislikes than I've ever gotten compared yeah. to my last videos and yeah some people mm-hmm. actually just straight up attacked me i'm like whoa 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 i clearly said this is just for me or then other people be like oh no it's because you got to try a sativa or an indica or they'll just make another <laughs> yeah but yeah yeah i completely get what you're saying and i'm i was defensive with psychedelics and weed so i know exactly where they're coming from as well yeah um well cool i guess i want to this is going to be a big question but what is god to you Ooh, the G word, or people get very God. about that word. 
I think that's. I think for me at least, I've noticed a catalyst. I can I can tell a lot of people, or I can't just tell, but uh, mm-hmm. what what I think personally is that you know the the way you perceive the word God is is a big indicator of where you are on your path. Yeah. Um, because I think the beginning step is you know for a lot of us is there's two ways it goes either either you start with the belief of God as as usually in the West a monistic kind of deity figure thing okay. in the sky like, like a bearded dude that judges you if you're yes exactly or not. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that has an identity and that has yeah. personality traits uh, somehow um, and then you get to a point where when you kind of see through that veil you become very anti the word God right you you just don't even want to talk about the word God if somebody uses the word God you you think down upon them mm. um, you know you roll your eyes but. <laughs> The only the only terminology of the word God that I think even makes sense, but I also think it's true, is um, the Hindu definition of the word God in the Advaitic view or the non-dual view, which yeah. is known as Brahman. Mm-hmm. Brahman is is and Brahman's not God. You know, the wording and the idea of God as a monistic identity figure is a Western thing. Yeah. In Hinduism, Brahman is totality. It's all of potential existence. So it's not a thing. It's what we are. It's what everything is. Okay. So it's it's all of space, it's, all of time, the it's universe. Reality. It's reality. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's also what is beyond, beyond what we could ever think, conceive, understand, beyond time, beyond the beginning of the universe. All of the itness of anything that ever possibly could be is Brahman. Mm. And that's God in Hinduism. Is that, that is what God, that's the only way God can be anything. Because to have it as anything else would mean there's something besides it, right? Yeah. There would be something separate. If there is a God, that means that God exists in a finite space. Well, then what is that space beyond God? It, it wouldn't make sense. Everything falls apart in any other definition besides just everything. Mm. I don't know if you watch um, Leo from Actualize.org, but I like his, <clears throat> he has a, a phrase he called God is absolute infinity i like that yes exactly that and that, that's what brahman is what he's yeah. talking about is, is, is yeah. the invited view but just more in a rational infinity. phrasing i suppose yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's a better western word is absolute infinity is a better, yes. better way to say it it's just the, the simplest way in the way alan watts likes to say it, it's everything god is everything no yeah but it's also beyond everything because as soon as we have the word everything there's an idea of what everything means and it has a limit beyond even that. Yeah. Yeah. yes exactly it's <laughs> limitless it's just the whole of potential reality is what we should, I think, classify God as, mm. you know, or, or the Brahman as, because yeah. it, it stops being a thing and starts being, okay, that this is what existence is. Yeah, and it also makes us divine by nature, because mm. if everything is God, if everything is Brahman, we are an incarnate version of totality. We are God manifesting in this human form. Mm. And that's one of the big, the big uh, theories of Hindu philosophy is that this reality is the Leela, right? It's the play, the divine play. If all the of reality is giggle, here, almost. yeah, exactly, <laughs> cosmic giggle. And what we are is we're just God coming into, or the universe coming into a human form. That yet we're not aware that we are the whole of reality, and that's the point of life in a lot of ways in these philosophies is to remember our innate nature, which is that we are God, that we are all of reality, and that's the most empowering thing I think you could ever hear. That yeah. you are all of this. You know what? What else do you need? Where else do you need validation? What else? What kind of confidence boost is bigger than knowing that you are everything that ever has existed and ever will? It's just, you know, that that to me is a number one liberator. That that's that's true, you know, I think peace is understanding that. Yeah. But at the same time it can be terrifying because that means that we're all the darkness, all the fucked up shit in the universe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that just comes with our with our identification with what mm. we want something to be. And that, mm. that's where the attachment stems. Yeah, exactly. Like, um <laughs> Enlightenment. What what does that mean to you? And oh. what, what do you believe? What what is what is what is enlightenment anymore? I don't know. There's so many. En- <laughs> en- enlightenment <laughs> is uh, enlightenment's just one of those shiny words you see like at a you know when when you're driving down the road and you see you know, a blinking light like open, and you're like oh yes that's what enlightenment is. It's something that it, it, it's something out there that you'll never really get. Yeah. It's just the thing. Uh, enlightenment to me is is really just our true inherent nature, which is a Zen kind of nature, is just being, just being, pure beingness, without, without conception, without prioritization, without idealization of what mm. things should be. When you're just with it, when you're just being, that's an enlightened state. Um, that's Satori, that's the Satori experience. It's yeah. just with everything. There's no, you know, Tom perceiving things in a meditative or peaceful state or Koi perceiving. It's just pure perception outside of identity. That's the only thing meditation or uh, enlightenment really ever could be. 
Um, and I think that's a big problem. You know, that's the paradox of spiritual practice is that we all begin as seekers. And the only thing seeking is the ego. The ego is saying, I want enlightenment, right? I want to be, I want to reach, attain nirvana. I, I want to attain moksha. Yeah, um, yeah. And so a good way I like to term it all, uh, to word it is that it, spiritual practice is just steps towards steplessness. You know, we're taking steps and we're seeking until we realize what we seek is right here. Mm. And then we don't need anything else. And we're with it and we have it. Um, and we are, because we are it by by default. It just takes that kind of getting through the, that spiritual material muck of like searching for that, you know, that buzzword of enlightenment and mm. the shininess of it. And, the, you know, the, oh, yes, I want to be in this, you know. I think a lot of the problems is that people think enlightenment is some state where you're just like orgasmically living 24 <laughs> 7. It's in pure bliss. Out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. that's not what it is either. You know, that that's uh, also, you know, a very, a very bodily rooted thing is you think that enlightenment's a physical feeling, right? Of just like, oh, I feel so great. Well, that's you seeing, <laughs> feeling something and saying, oh, this is a great feeling for me, my body. It's just, it's just being with it all outside of your personal vantage of what you want it to be. Mm. Yeah. Um, Listening to an audiobook, uh, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, and it talks about yep, all this. Chagam Trungpa. Yeah. Yep. So, someone Chagam emailed me, it's like, you gotta, um, you got to yeah, read this book over and over and I over this, again. Uh, <laughs> I have the whole book condensed on this piece of paper right here. Oh, what? That's awesome. Yeah. I condensed the whole book into like the, the biggest bullet points that I, I can use in my life. <laughs> can you send me that? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'll send you a picture of it. Nice. Um, beautiful, beautiful, powerful book. Yeah, and like, like you said, like it's one of those things. Like, if the ego like wants to attain something, and it goes through, and sometimes a lot of the spiritual practices can just be reinforced in the ego without you even yes, realizing. Yes, yes, definitely. And, and that was that was one of my problems, especially having a channel. Was like I need to be this this spiritual yeah, teacher. You no, know, I, I have yeah. to be, you know, presentable. At one point, I was like, I need to get rid of my tattoos because I've never seen a guru with tattoos. Yeah. It's like, well, that's the ego wanting you to to fit a role. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what most of us go into spiritual practice with is I like, I want to be this spiritual role, right? I want to be this, like this, this shining beacon of light. And it's like, well, that's what you are outside of you wanting to be it. If you get rid of all that, you're already there. Exactly. And it's nice that's to just kind of let go and not care and just be yourself. You give a yeah, shit. Totally. Totally. Um, cause I, I yeah, I, I, I relate as well. Cause when I started the channel, I was a lot more, I guess, serious. And I'm like, Oh, I should be this. If I'm teaching people about personal growth, and then I'd feel bad mm -hmm. if I regress or, you know, I hit a yes. speed bump or something like that. But then it's important to forgive yourself that you're human and we're always going to yes. fuck up. And that's okay. I mean, that, that's why I, I respect Alan Watts so much. And that's why for me, writing that first book about all my, my mess ups in life and my imperfections is important because we, we don't, you don't, it's, I think it's harmful to have teachers that present themselves as perfect mm. because nobody is. Um, you know, even, even saints and siddhas in India have childhoods and they probably do things that you wouldn't think is saintly. Um, yeah. but, uh, Alan Watts would always talk about, you know, what you're seeing is the in entertainer Alan Watts, right? I'm putting on the persona of Alan Watts, the most Alan Wattsy Alan Watts when I sit down and speak, but yeah. you're not seeing who I am every day with my family. You know, no. you're not seeing you know, my slight drinking problems. You're seeing the me that I present to you to give you the most peace that you need to understand mm. what I'm saying. But he was, always, he was, he was transparent, though, as well. That's exactly, very transparent. That's what I. Admirable. That's why I respect him so much. Um, um, yeah, I'm just saying. Like, I, like I was just doing a, a like, you know, I'll do a few live stream. People were like, "Oh, you're so, you have such a sweet soul, and you're so inspiring." And I'm like, "That's me on camera. Like, you don't know how I am." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting, you know. Uh, another thing that what's funny is I'm not sure if you got to it yet in that book, but what Trungpa always talks about is how the ego. All, it's, all the ego seeks is security, right? That's all we want is security. Mm. And enlightenment or spiritual, you know, awakening is another form of security. It's that kind of, well, once I'm in this state, once I've become enlightened, once I've attained that awakening, a dangerous then trap. I'm good to go. Once yeah, I then have I'm this, then I'll be happy. Yeah. Then I'm bulletproof. I'm fine. Nothing can hurt me because I'm there. It's like, well, that's also your ego is saying, you know, once I'm here, I'll... it's the same thing. The exact same thing is saying, once I have a five-bedroom house and two kids and I'm making $200,000 a year, yeah. then I'll be fine. It's, yeah. it's the exact same thing. We're just putting a spiritual title on it. And therefore, we, we perceive it as different when it's not. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so, it's, yeah, it's a very easy trap to fall into. And I see yeah. it all the time. And I Even always notice. You know, well, yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like I feel bad, though, because I, when I 
when you explain this to a lot of people, and I'm sure some people listening now will feel this, it's kind of like popping someone's balloon, you know? Mm-hmm. It's really deflating to be like, oh, okay. You know, it's, it's not out there. But I think it's, it's, it's necessary to get rid of that ego conception of what, what that awakening is. Yes. Better to burst that bubble now than yeah, so yeah, you learn the hard way, you know? And sometimes yeah, and people so might you... hate you for it or they might get triggered, but it might even take them six months. I'm like, oh, I actually get... I understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I've had that happen before. Like, okay. you know, I'll listen to some teachers and they'll actually trigger me at the start. But then six months later, those lessons will sink in. I'm like, ah, oh, I understand what they were saying now. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Um, um, well, I, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about uh, your YouTube channel. Like, what have you shifted direction? Like, what are your, what are your plans in the future? Yeah, I think my plans in the future are just to continue reflecting my practice and what I find to be the most important uh, topic to cover uh, going forward. And that's what I think is, you know, spiritual growth and personal development. I think that's, that's the catalyst to everything, you know, so that, that for me is what my channel has become. Um, And it was when I began, I mean, I, I, like I said, I got some, at some points I got into science and all these different philosophies, but I think, you know, I'm trying to come back to a simpler place and a more, I think, potent place. Yeah. So that that's kind of where it's going to be continuing to go, you know, for the foreseeable future. Awesome. Um, do you have you or do you still go through like uh, self doubt or uh, moments that you've wanted to quit your channel or maybe you let some haters get to you? Things. Like I mean, that? not really. It's not haters. It's more so the internal battle that's always there. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the paradox of being a creator is uh, you're always going to be thinking, you know, how can I be better? What can I do? How can I change that? Which is natural. Yeah. Um, so that's the only thing that pops up every once in a while, but not too often. I think, you know, now, thankfully, uh, it's been a couple of years that I've been on YouTube. I've kind of worked my way through that, especially yeah. in the first year to where I, I, I all I know is that I'm doing the best I can. That I am trying to present what I think is the most important information, and, mm. you know, that I'm not doing it from any place outside of anything but love and caring for all these people that, that watch. Because that's all I do is I, I'm writing a book, you know, I'm working with them. I'm trying to set up a meditation center. Nice. I really just want to interact with people and, you know, do so in a loving way. So I think when you know you're coming from the best place you can come from, it's really hard to care about criticisms because it's yeah. like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm literally doing my best. So that is all I can offer <laughs> like, you, you know, and like, for some, what do you fuck is one from me? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, I'm sorry. This is all I can, I yeah. can offer you. So here is my best shot. And that's kind of what, you know, my channel is right now is me really trying to do the best I can. Um, I'm presenting again, like what I, what I think is the most important information. Now, again, it's, it's subjective to me, but it's not, it's based on what I've read from lots and lots of teachers, you know? So it's, it's, it's a lineage of taking all this information from all these different teachers and these gurus and the swamis that I visit up the road, uh, every, you know, every couple of days of the temple I go to and really trying to convey that into, into, into a, a medium that can mm. influence my age group, young people, young kids growing yeah. up and learning and um, doing about. so in a, in a modern way. And that's all my channel is, is modernizing teachings. And that's, that's you know, I say that. I'm, I'm just telling you what has been told to me yeah. in, in a way that I think you can yeah. understand better. Because a lot of these words. books, yeah. yeah, a lot of these books are hard to, hard to comprehend if you're reading them for the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally agree. Like you said, it's all about the internal battles. And, you know, yes, like if, if a you know, negative comment triggers you, then it's just something that you haven't owned. Yeah, it's your, yeah, Yogi Bhajan had a quote, and it was something along the lines of, um, "If you see, I forget, I'm, I'm gonna totally botch it, but uh, <laughs> it's all good. it was something along the lines of, if you see the way somebody acts towards you as a reflection of their internal state versus a reflection of what you are doing, mm. you'll cease to react at all. So, yeah. like you just said, if you can come to see that the way people are reacting is most often because of where they are internally and not because of where you are." on your path and with what you were doing, it becomes less of a detriment to you. It becomes less of a painful thing. You know, yeah. if, if again, like you said, if I'm talking about marijuana and talking about why I stopped and giving insight and somebody attacks me for it, it's, it's not me doing anything wrong by giving an insight. It's, it's them in a space where they are still identified with the compound and therefore are having an emotional reaction, mm. which is also natural. Yeah. So it's, it's just that kind of process of seeing that, okay, you're there on your path. I'm here on my path. We're at different spaces. I love you. I respect you. And I hope one day we'll be able to see each other's views, you know, yeah. on, on a mutual foundation. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Well, awesome, man. I'm going to, I have a few Instagram questions that mm-hmm. I asked from people. So yeah, I just handpicked a few of my favorite ones. Um, no problem. Yeah. So we've got Sam the Owl 
asks, what is the key to staying spiritual in a non-spiritual group of friends? The key is not to identify your group of friends as non-spiritual. Let's yeah. start with that. So, like so, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so you, you saying that you're with non-spiritual friends is you already boxing your friends out of what you consider your spiritual practice to be. And that, that's your ego, even if you don't mean to. It's not a bad thing, but that's it's your ego saying, oh, I'm spiritual and they're not, you know. <laughs> Um, it, it, that, that would be superior than you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that that comparison is going to hold you back. If I was driving down the street every day, um, you know, I, I I would say I practice a lot of spiritual practice. But if I'm driving down the street and I, everyone I see, I say that's not a spiritual person. That's not a spiritual person. You know, I'm going to I isolate myself, um, and that isolation becomes harrowing because all you're focusing on is where you are versus where they are. Yeah. You're you're boxing yourself in. So all you can do is, again, see them as, as a tool, the same way you see meditation as a tool and self-inquiry as a tool. Spending time around people that aren't in the same place mentally as you is a great way for you to practice mindfulness, mm. to practice right thought, right action, right speech, You know what you think about them, why. It helps us get out of this idea of trying to make it us versus them or me versus them. Yeah, putting labels, think, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Removing and, I, those yeah. labels. and I can understand because, like, for example, when I start eating healthy or something like that, and I'd look at people not eating healthy, I'll, I'll separate myself. Not that I yes. think I'm better and, and than it's them, kind of, but it's, it's like, unconscious. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. An instinctual or, reaction yeah. going, oh, yeah. ew, that's gross. You know? And yeah. that's or, part of the yeah. practice is learning not to say that, learning not yeah. to, to jump into a situation where it has to be. A, exactly. a, a, a rift between the two. We're just on different stages on our personal yes, exactly. on our self-development. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. when I started psychedelics or when I first did ayahuasca, I would look at people who haven't done psychedelics and like, you don't get it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's so silly. Yeah, it's all complete ego. That's, that's spiritual ego. Yeah, yeah, just exactly. Hiding, yeah. hiding yourself in our practice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it, just what you said just reminded me, I just wanted to ask you this before I go on the um, Instagram questions, but what are your daily like spiritual practices and like what are you what are, what are your I guess daily habits to keep you in this peak state so that's actually what what my um my second book is about is daily spiritual practice and, and how we can take the, the mundane things or what we consider to be yeah. the mundane things and the regular things and turn them into mindful practices um my, my days differ but usually it's just I wake up uh, I do yoga I'll meditate I'll make a smoothie, drink some water, <laughs> and then I will get into my daily whatever, you know, going yeah. out, doing things, climbing, um, working. It just depends on what's on my schedule. Yeah. Uh, and I do whatever my daily stuff is, and then I come home, or I'm already home, <laughs> and I will usually read for a while, listen to lectures. I try to always listen to lectures every day or read every day. I think it's really important to reinforce yourself with new information. Um, yeah, but pertinent information, you know, not, not trying to force information in from all over the place, but finding what works for you and continuing to, uh, you know, Re absorb that. Learn that. Yeah. Instead of yes. going into this place of, uh, yes. information constipation, if you want to call yes. it that. Un un until it becomes a space where you can remember it and it's part of your mind. You know, if, if you can't remember yeah. the Buddhism, well, listen to it every day on, on repeat, read about it every day until you can memorize it. And then once you know it, it's internalized. Exactly. So I try to do that. And then I'll just wind down at night, you know, have dinner. Um, I always try to stop eating in at least two hours before bed because, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's better. It helps you dream more, too, when you're, you're not digesting. It's less focused from your body on other parts of your body. Yeah. And I enjoy dreams. I like to lose a dream and stuff. Yeah. So um, I'll just do that. And then I'll just kind of wind down at night, play some music. Um, if people are over, I'll enjoy my time with them. And then I'll usually just go to bed or meditate before bed and, and pass out. Try to no. keep it, uh, you know, very simple. Yeah. Now there, there's a lot in between on that, but, but that's what the book is going to be about, or else yeah. I, would, I would share it. Of course. <laughs> awesome. Um, yes. You mentioned lucid dreaming, which is mm -hmm. I enjoy lucid. I, I don't lucid dream all the time, but I enjoy it. It's very, very trippy. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, um, do you? So, what about? Is that something that you do regularly? Like, is, does does lucid dreaming come naturally to you, or do you still do like? The, the reality checks all the time and when you go to bed and all these techniques or does it come it, de it depends um sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't uh, it just depends on what i've been doing that day when i'm going to sleep yeah. uh, if i wake up again in the middle of the night or not yeah i don't i don't i haven't recently been trying to do it a lot but it does happen every once in a while but i do just like dreaming in general you know i have a 
dream journal. So I like I like to write oh, down okay. my dreams. Yeah. I like to document what I, what I'm dreaming because yeah. dream dreams are I think the most manifested point of subconscious and unconscious thoughts and experiences kind of doing their thing in your mind while it's reprogramming and cleaning itself yeah. out or well, Carl, Carl, Carl Jung, Jung was really weeks. into dream and yes, like analysis yes yes definitely so. yes that was one of the main points where him and Sigmund Freud disagreed was yes. you know, Freud would just say it's just it's just normal stuff and Carl yeah. Jung's like no it's it's definitely more yeah Freud was so. like I like there's a lot of things that I agree and admire about Freud but for yeah him, everything just came back to just Everything that you do is all because sex. of your parent and sex. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. How nothing you else. And how you procreate. And I was just like snorting lines all the time. <laughs> yeah. have, have you watched? Um, there's a movie that came out recently about Freud and really? Jung. Yeah, it was really good. I forget what it's called. If you remember, please I mean, message me because that sounds amazing. It might be uh, the Dangerous Mind. I think that's what it's called. Okay. Something like that. It's okay. really good though. I'll check it out. Um, yeah. Astral projection. Is this something that you still practice? Is it something that you would recommend to other people? Do you think it might be dangerous? Like, what are your dangerous? Thoughts? No, not at all. Absolutely not. Um, I've never personally experienced any dangers from it. But again, it all comes down to where you are mentally going into it. You know, if, if yeah. I'm if I'm having a bad day, I probably shouldn't take LSD. You know, it's, it's not. Set, it's setting. You want it, you want, mm. Yeah, exactly. Setting it is huge. And that's mind, the, your mind, your mind state when you go to sleep or when you lay down is your setting for those um, occurrences. I haven't been doing it a lot lately just because I've been doing a lot of different things. It just has not been on my, on my plate or my focus, but I would recommend it to everybody to okay. attempt astral projections. Would you, would you recommend starting off with lucid dreaming? Yes. First? Yeah. Okay. I, that, I, that's usually I what I say. This, well, yeah, yeah. What is astral projection anyway? Like is... For, from my understanding, because I haven't had too much experience with astral projection, um, mm -hmm. but from what I understand is lucid dreaming just delving deep into your own personal unconscious and an astral projection is like kind of delving into the collective unconscious in a sense. These are just that, words. I'm just, these way, just words I'm just saying. But. To explain it, yeah. I mean, I, I won't say what it is or isn't because I, I have no idea. Yeah, that's why I'm but, just labeling uh, it, but more you can take it as a metaphor and analogy if you yeah, want. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's just my, my I think dumb lucid way dreaming is more it. so just lucid dreaming is really just being aware of a dream, being in a dream, being aware of it at the same time. Um, there might be slight aspects of control in that, but it's it's limited. Astral projection is either you are or you aren't, whether you like. Just decide it. You know, it's basically projecting your soul, your essence of conscious reality. What whatever makes the electrical impulses in your brain create a system that experiences yeah. outside of your you. body. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're projecting outside of your body into this 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 different realm that you have full control over. And to me, that was one of the biggest awakening processes. From, was my first astral projection because it made me realize how little of a clue I had in the grand scheme of things. You know, I thought I understood what life and death was and that there was a black and white of I'm living, I'm a, I'm a carbon-based organism, I'm gonna die, that's it, you know, there's no afterlife. To having an astral projection and realizing, okay, there's a whole realm of reality that I just experienced that is does not fit into the model I just made. So I really have no idea what I'm talking about and I'll never assume I do again. So that, that, was, that was a big, you know, it shut me up yeah. uh, in a good way. Yeah, so yeah. I, always, I always recommend astral projection. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, it might, it might, be, might be safer than psychedelics as well if people are yeah, too afraid is. to go into it. Um, that's yeah. what I'd recommend to people like who are too afraid to go to psych, uh, explore psychedelics. Like, yes, try, lucid, try lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is actually more psychedelic than a psychedelic. Like, it's so yeah. out there and trippy. And it's like, oh, especially when you're the first moments of when you're conscious that you are dreaming, it's like more real than real. It's so bizarre, but fucking insane yes i struggle absolutely. staying lucid though because i get so excited mm -hmm. but i found that, that was good, my problem when i when i first asked to project it is i was like oh i'm doing it and then i, I woke back you up. go back i found a Came good, back i body. found a good way to stay lucid is to just like maybe go to the ground and actually be very mindful of the tactile sensations and like yes, touch yes. the ground and stuff that's what helped me anyway so if yeah, you guys want it's a great tool it's a good idea <laughs> So if you guys want to know more about lucid dreaming and astral projection, go check out Koi's channel because I know that yeah. you made a lot of videos on it. I made yeah, like I one know, video on, a bunch. on lucid dreaming, but then I just focused on psychedelics. So Yeah, I think I've got close to 10, so definitely a decent amount. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, now we'll go back to the <laughs> Instagram questions because there were just some things that I, I just remembered. Um, what do we got here? Okay, so Marcel Petrus Truselli. 
asks, what is your opinion on the current relationship between science and spirituality in mainstream culture? In mainstream culture, um, I think, before I get into mainstream culture, I think um, for, for a lot of um, practitioners, you know, especially in spiritual practice and scientific practice, there's a big growing community that understands the, the importance of what does exist between them, and that is that they are they're unified. You know, science and spirituality are, are codependent. Mm. They don't exist independently. We we can perceive them as independent, but they're not. You know, it's the same way that a a coin, you know, has a heads and a tails, but they're just contextual, right? It's just a coin. We just say, okay, this is heads, this is tails. You know, science and spirituality are two sides of the same coin. Um, that being said, I, I, that's the another reason I've kind of strayed away from science and started focusing on the soul is because Spiritual practice isn't dogmatic. It's open-ended. There's just endless, endless possibilities to what can and can't work. And subjectivity is very important. And I think that is what human life is. You know, it's it's, sub, it's billions so just, of subjective well, experience. It's like um, Jason Silver. He says that subjectivity is literally the only point of view that we have. So it's yes, so exactly. preposterous that we like kind of throw that in the superstitious yeah. in the superstition bin. Which is yeah. my biggest gripe with science is that it's, it it just it just throws away subjectivity. You know, you can't you can't do that because the whole fa- <laughs> basis of science itself is founded on subjective ideas of this is what science is. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so to me, you know, science in the mainstream is, is is exists in that same dogmatic box as religion saying this is what this religion is, this is what it's not. You know, this is what science is, this is what it's not. And the problem is that when Things like science and spirituality, they're always making breakthroughs. Things are always changing. There's groundwork that is always being laid. You know, we're always evolving and growing and learning more. Yeah. So if, if we create a box at any point in time and say this is what science is, the problem with that is that as soon as something happens or there is a discovery or something changes or occurs outside that box, it's automatically labeled as non-scientific. And it, it's not given the time of day. And that, that's, that's a dangerous, dangerous game to play. Well, lucid dreaming for the longest time was uh, yes. denounced by science, and they, they mm-hmm. called it, you know, superstition, su- uh, mm-hmm. pseudoscience, uh, voodoo, whatever they want to call it, and then it got scientifically proven. But it's because, and it's like all you have to do is actually just try it yourself, and then you can empirically prove that it's actually a real yes. phenomena. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's another problem with science is that for a lot of people, and this is me included, until I started getting into spiritual practice, is that when when you subscribe to science right off the bat, before you have any spiritual inclination in t- internally, it's the same as being raised in, raised in a, a religion, because you basically say, no matter what someone says, what idea they might have, your brain thinks, well, you can't prove it, it's ridiculous. You know, you, you, you toss it out, and that's how I was. You know, people would talk about lucid dreaming and astral projection, and I'd be like, you can't prove it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, w- I wouldn't even give it time of day to think about it. You know, I'd be like, you can't prove that, I'm not gonna try it. And th- that's, again, it's a dangerous way to think. You're, you're shutting yourself off simply because the box you sit inside says you should do so. Yeah. And that's what, you know, mainstream science does in a lot of ways. You're triggering, you're triggering a lot of people, Koi. I can just feel that. Yeah. <laughs> One of the, well, you know what really opened me up to it a lot? Uh, I think I opened a lot of people up to it is that uh, Terrence McKenna talked about this in one of his lectures. And it's yeah. one of my favorite things he's ever said. And he basically was talking about, you know, how the basis of science, the number one foundational basis in science is the speed of light as a constant, right? Mm. So we have the speed of light as a constant. Um, and that is what we, that is how we found the majority of mathematics and understanding of physics is, be, is using the speed of light as the only constant. Nothing else is a constant in existence except the speed of light. Um, but his, his whole thought was what if the speed of light is only the speed it is right now, right? So what we're seeing is light. We're measuring light in 2000, whatever, five, six, even if it's hundred year period. Who's to say light was not moving slower or faster before this point in time? What if mm. a million years ago light was moving slower? What if 10,000 years from now light begins moving faster? It's just one of those things. It's like even that question, that's a very possible question. It's the same way car speed up, you know, or that when you start running, you're going faster than when you were walking. Your body mm. speeds up. Like, we if don't know at the end of the day. <laughs> yes. The problem is if this is true, even on like a microscopic level, all of science falls apart. All of our math, all of our systems that under, come to understand physics, they all fall apart because we're basing it on what we believe to be using faith the same way religion does, that light is a constant. Yeah. The speed of light is a constant. And this is not it's saying true. that science is like religion. It's more exactly. the attitude of certain people have towards it. Yes, similar, exactly. It, it, is it, a similar it, dogmatic thing. Yeah. 
Yes, it's, it's forcing. What we have to accept is that the basis of science is just at its core. You know, we, we can prove things, but at its base, it is based on faith the same way religion is. And that is something you have to understand is that it's just as malleable. Oh, some people, a lot of people are never going to accept that. Yes. <laughs> That's the thing. It's, it's one of those things kind of like facts. You know, non-acceptance doesn't mean that it's not true. Mm. It simply is the way things are founded. Mm. So that is, that is why, you know, you'll see, especially things with like quantum mechanics, what we're dealing with now with entanglement. It, it throws a lot of ancient ways of thinking, especially with Einstein's you know, theory yeah, of relativity. The, out the Newtonian physics, yeah. Newtonian physics, exactly. So that's the thing. It's always changing. It's always growing. So to say anything is a certain way is, is ignorant because it's only a certain way right yeah. now. Because we, like, we, like we like to know things, right? Well, our ego yes, exactly. feels and comfort. And it's, very, it's right. very well true that it might be that way forever. That might be how it is. Light might be a constant. But it's equally important to be aware that it might not. Yes. That's, the, that's the important thing. Is exactly. Accept, understanding science but also seeing that it too is a system that is just like anything else temporary and malleable and changeable <laughs> exactly so, all right guys he's not saying that the speed of light <laughs> isn't constant he's just questioning it that's all <laughs> exactly and that, that, that's what mckenna pros mckenna was saying the same thing he's saying just what if that's yeah exactly important. just question it yeah yeah uh, and questioning is you know that's the key <laughs> awesome man um okay i've got another question here um what's okay so I'm not even going to pronounce that name. Mark Kyle Solis asks, ask him the last time he did something wrong or mean or something harmful to someone unintentionally and how to deal with forgiving yourself or not being too harsh on yourself for when you have hurt another being. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, let me think of an example. The thing is, is if, if you know and you truly do believe that what you did, you understand the mistake you made, that's all it takes, right? Is your understanding. If mm. you can admit to a situation, that's all you can do. You know, forgive yourself. It's like if I drop a plate and it breaks. If I'm aware that, okay, I just made a mistake and I broke the plate, that's all it is. I, I either, all I can do in that moment is either sit there and, and just cry about the plate for hours and days and keep it in my mind, or I can clean it up and move on. Mm. And that, that's, that's what forgiveness is, right? Forgiving the self, especially saying, okay, I made a mistake. I'm aware of it. Now that I'm aware of it, I can either liberate myself from it and move on and, and use that experience to do better in the future. Or I can allow it to manifest in my mind and brood in my mind and, and worry me going forward. And the problem with that is that it, it, since you're thinking of it, you're subconsciously manifesting mistakes again. Mm -hmm. So since you're always aware of this mistake and worried about this mistake, it, you run the possibility of making that mistake again. Mm. Um, I say the last time I made it, I mean, I make mistakes every single day. I say I make the most mistakes in traffic, right? Because it's just so hard not to get upset in traffic. That's when the caveman DNA starts settling in. Yes, yes <laughs> yeah. exactly. So that's what happens to me. You know, somebody will cut me off and my first thought will be like, this this a-hole, you know? Yeah. And then I'll get a mile down the road and be like, it's just a human. You know, they probably didn't do it on purpose. It probably wasn't malicious. Yeah. So why was I so upset? He, he might be so like say, late to work or like a doctor's appointment and he's like gone through like some really you know, negative things in his family. You exactly. never know. Exactly. And the thing is, even if he's not, I still need to love him, right? Yeah. Even if even if he cut me off on purpose, I still I still love him. I still yeah. love him. Because they are in a space in their life where doing that is something that they wanted to do. And that's, you know, I, I, I empathize with that. I feel bad. I hope they grow. And mm. that's, you know, that that's what is important on their path is kind of doing that. Is even if people hurt you saying, look, I, I love you and I hope for the best. And I hope you can grow through this process so you don't hurt others in the future. Mm. And it's okay to get you know, three seconds delay to where you're going to go. Like, you'll, yes, you'll be totally. okay. You're so it's, okay to, it's okay to be a week delayed so long as you come to the space where you can understand that you were delayed and move forward. Uh, it, it's a practice in spirituality called catch and release, right? How, how fast can I catch myself in my ego or in, in this negative space and release myself from it? Yeah. And that's where you see the, not the highest, but, but the most, I guess, in touch spiritual practitioners and people is that they're in this space of catch and release that happens almost instantaneously. Yeah. That, so that it almost doesn't happen at all. Mm. And that's why they seem free of these emotional bondages. And that's what spiritual practice does for us. It allows us to get to that space where we can catch and release very, very quickly. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Good answer, man. Um, we'll go one more question. Um, Beautiful. So Trippy Views asks, how far into his diet is he planning to take himself. By that I mean, does he plan on 
Does he plan on or has he thought of going raw vegan, fruitarian? Much love to both of you. Koi, you inspired me to go vegan, man, a while back. Mm. Smiley face. Well, I'm glad I could inspire you. Um, I don't have any plans for it really other than, than being vegan. That's what matters to me is, you know, just limiting suffering. So I am limiting suffering. Um, I, I think anything beyond that is just one of those personal preference type things. You know, mm. if, if you want to be fruitarian or raw, by all means do so. Um, if you think it helps you and you're doing it for health benefits, again, by all means do so. It's totally your choice. Um, the thing I would say, though, and what I've noticed is a lot is if you're doing it because you're trying to accomplish something to gain another title, maybe watch where that's stemming from. Because I know a lot of people that are, you know, that have pride in their being a raw vegan or being a fruitarian. Mm. You know, I'll put it in so, my bio. And I'll it's another say, identification, you know, right? Yeah. Yes, it's another accolade. It's another spiritual accolade. So be, be wary of where that inspiration stems from. If you're doing it because you think it's the healthiest thing, logically, by all means do so. But if you're doing it because you see it as an accomplishment and you're vying for that, mm. um, that might be somewhere you want to, you can still do it, but try to rethink why you were doing it. Mm. Make it make it less of a you thing and more of a, of a what's best for the body and what's best for the planet thing. Yeah, exactly. And don't force yourself too much. Take it step yeah, by exactly. step. That's what, I, you know, yeah. that's what I did, I Maybe guess. Steps. Like right now, I suppose while I'm in Thailand, I guess I'm on a vegan diet. But even then, I yeah. wouldn't. I don't like labeling myself that way um, yeah, because yeah, it just identifies me with another group. I just eat what yep. I want to eat, and then what happens if I eat? You know, because I like to eat honey. Sometimes I like to eat fish, and then mm -hmm. you know, if I consider myself a vegan, then what? What's that going to do for me? Then yes, exactly. I'm going to feel then, guilty then and I'm going to feel about, bad. About what people label. What people think of me, especially like. Yeah, because as soon as you label yourself vegan, and if you eat any animal products, then yeah, you're gonna you're gonna cop an earful for sure. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, but who knows when I get back? Because I've been feeling a lot more clear-headed for sure, and just emotionally uh, grounded. So beautiful. Yeah, it's been really good. Definitely a lot of fruit here, man. Wow. I believe it. It's, it's probably it's, endless fruit. Yeah, I, like I don't know about being a fruitarian because like, but if it works for you, it works for you. Um, but. I guess with any diet, if you are going to switch, uh, you just got to be careful and overcome. You know, you got to just yeah, be mindful. Do your research. You. Yeah, because sometimes you know you can still be vegan and incredibly unhealthy. You know what I mean? Like, yes, yes, definitely, that's what definitely, people, definitely. You know that I tell people, you know, twink, Twinkies are vegan. You know, yeah, it doesn't mean you, that's all you can eat. You Pasta's know, you, you, vegan, bread's vegan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, you're you're going to suffer the consequences if you eat that every single day. Um, Precisely. Not saying that I never eat bread or pasta, but I'm aware that it's not good for me. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. awesome, man. It's been a very interesting conversation. We've covered a yeah, lot. Yeah, you too, brother. Now. Yeah, it's been an honor, man. Um, it's a great, great way to uh, start my morning. <laughs> I'm gonna bed now. <laughs> I'm gonna get up early. I want to watch the. I got invited to watch the Mayweather, Conor McGregor fight. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so that should be interesting. But yeah, dude. Um, what? Where can people find you? Um, I'll leave like links on the show notes below. So. Yeah, no problem. Um, um, if you'd like to check out my videos, just feel free to go to uh, YouTube.com/slash Koi's Corner. K O I S C O R N E R. That's my channel. I upload every couple of days. You know, I usually do three to four videos a week, so a decent amount of content. Um, if you'd like to pick up my book, it's on Amazon. It's called A Not So Enlightened Youth. Okay. It's kind of about part my story, part you know the steps I take in my daily life to yeah. to come into my practice out of my ego, which was I think is the hardest part of starting our practice. Um, yeah, and that's and I have a website as well, there's koifresh.co, and that's just you know I, I make a lot of necklaces, I do private consultations. If anybody ever has you know they want to speak privately, kind of like we're doing right now, I do Skype conversations and whatnot as well because I know a lot of people don't want their information out there, which is totally mm -hmm. respectable. Yeah. And yeah, and then all, all my other handles are the same across Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Snapchat. I just boy fresco. So come hang out and, and enjoy life. Awesome. You know, speak to me, talk to me. Let's have, let's have a, a discussion. And like I always encourage people, if you're struggling with anything, it's always good to talk to someone. Definitely. To Most Definitely. people suffer suffer in silence, and it yes. just doesn't help. It's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah, it's always, <laughs> yeah, it's always important sure. to remember that you know. You're, you're no one's responsibility but your own. So it's up to you to go out and, and you know, speak to people. You know, implement yourself with them, grow. It helps uh, tremendously. That, that, yeah. yeah, that first step, you have to take it. You have to take that step for yourself. People can help you take steps, but that first step is important for you to take mm. on your own. Well, it's like, the again, another cliche saying, but I find that a lot of the cliche ones are the most true. Is like, you yes. know, the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, right? 
Yep. Yeah. There's a one of my favorite ones is that uh, the best time to plant a seed it was 20 years ago, the second best time <laughs> today. Yeah. So, you know, there you, yeah. Awesome. Everything like you know, we, we could have started yesterday, but even if you didn't, you, you have you have today. And that's the that's the beauty of life is you can start right now. Cool. Well, that's a good way to end the podcast. Um, well, yeah, man. Well, we'll keep in touch. Um, I've like I said, I've always wanted to go to LA, so one day when I do, make sure to yes, anytime, anytime you're out here, I, I I'd love to uh, house you and show you around. Yeah, awesome, brother. All right, man. We'll speak soon and send me that spiritual cheat sheet that you got. All right, yes, definitely. We'll, we'll do. All right, have a good night, brother. All right, have man. Day. Have a good day. All right, All right. see you, bro. Bye.